Uh, good morning, guys. My name's Ricky. Good to be with you guys today. Kids, good to have you guys in the room. Let me ask you guys a question. What is something that you, that you like, but at the same time you also don't like it? You know, something that you want, but also at the same time you don't want it. Exercising. Yes. Yes. It's like, hey, I want rock hard abs, but I don't want the process to get me those. Um, what do you mean, Ricky? You have those. What, you know, what, what are some other things? Any other things? Something you like, you want, but also at the same time you don't like it. Eli, go for it. Dieting. Di- dieting, yes. I love chocolate chip cookies. That should just be enough, right? You know, it's just like, God, give me just one thing where metabolism doesn't matter. That would be great. But I don't like what it does to my gut, yeah? Yeah, 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 right, right. You know, like, uh, we're, we're, you know, uh, in this, it was like, hey, I want a national championship, but I don't want to be an Alabama fan, right? You know, that it's kind of, it's kind of the path, right? You know, that, you know, and we have lots of things like that. I mean, even, and this isn't to like guilt trip, you know, but it's like, hey, we, we want to read the Bible. We want to experience the intimacy with Jesus. We want to be in community with others. But man, I don't know, you know, we don't always want to give up the time to do that. Hey, I like my cell phone, but I don't like that I spend too much time on it. And, and there, there are so many things that we have in life that we kind of like and we don't like or we want, but we also don't want. And I'll admit, I don't know about you guys, but when I read the Beatitudes here in Matthew 5, or even most of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm like, hey, I like that. Hmm, but I don't, I don't really like that. I want that, but I also don't, I don't really want that. And, and right here, we're, you know, we're kicking off into the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is giving this, this basically his big first message to the people that are following him. And he doesn't start off with this fun illustration He doesn't start off with this kind of like rallying everybody and yeah, let's get pumped. And the disciples are like, yeah, it's just like, oh, hey, here, here's who's blessed in this world. And this is what that looks like. And for the disciples, for the people that are following Jesus, this is probably not what they really expected. Wait a minute. I don't know if this is what we signed up for, Jesus. Hey, I thought you were Messiah. I thought you were going to come. You're going to like kind of get rid of the Romans. You're going to make everything better. All the circumstances will be better around us because all of this is messed up. And Jesus, all right, we're all sitting down. We're ready for you. The crowd's here. What do you have to say? Ah, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Huh. Didn't, you didn't hook me in with that one, Jesus. Uh, why don't you, why don't you, have you listened to Ricky and given a movie quote? That would have been great, (laughs) right? And so what they're hearing is this kind of, this, this totally different orientation of what they think Jesus is going to say. It's kind of upside down from all of their expectations, what they thought would happen. And so today we're going to be looking at what is referred to as the B attitudes that are in Matthew 5. And then we're going to look at them and then how we should respond to what Jesus is saying. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew 5. It is the first book of the New Testament. It'll be probably about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. So Matthew 5, while you're turning there, just some, some context and some structure for Matthew, the writer, uh, as the Spirit of God is guiding him to write the Scriptures here, how he's kind of orchestrating things, how he's structuring things in the whole book. So in Matthew, right before this, in Matthew 4... Verse 23, it says this, Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee teaching in their synagogues. What is he teaching? He's preaching the good news of the kingdom, and he's healing every disease and sickness among the people. So Matthew kind of sets up this this intro to the Sermon on the Mount and all these upcoming chapters with that. This is what Jesus is doing. And then in chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus continued to go around to all the towns, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. So it's basically from chapter 4 to chapter 9, it's just a copy-paste. It's the same thing. Hey, this is what Jesus is doing. This is what Jesus is going to continue to do. And then in between chapter 4 and chapter 9 where it has that, is the Sermon on the Mount, and then Jesus going around and healing everybody. And so what that's, so, hey, Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, and he's healing every disease. And what do we see in there? He's healing every disease, and that's showing us the power of the kingdom of God, and ultimately, that God is saying, hey, 
Ultimately, in time to come, the kingdom of God is not meant to be a place of disease and sickness. God's kingdom is different. And so it's showing us the power of the kingdom. And with, with the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying, hey, and this is the way of the kingdom. The people that are, that are following me, this is what they look like. This is, this is what it, it looks like to be a person of the kingdom of God. And, and in this, he's not giving us a bunch of rules. We could kind of read through the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's just like, all right, here's what we got to do. But this isn't, hey, here's how to be a better person, everybody. A lot of people refer to the Sermon on the Mount as kind of like the, this crown on ethics. Hey, this is the best ethics out there. And Jesus is not saying, hey, I'm just coming to give you some cool behaviors. I'm not coming to give you just some ethic lesson on how to be a better person, how to be good. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, hey, this is what it looks like to be a new creation in me. This is what it looks like to have life with God, with Christ. Not some better version of you, not try harder. But this is life in me, a new person. And um, as we're looking through this, it's, it's very similar to the Ten Commandments uh, or, or in some ways. You know, again, Alex talked about it last week. Moses went up to the mountain. That's when God spoke. Jesus here, he sits on top of a mountain. Hey, God's speaking. And the, the Ten Commandments, it's a list of don'ts, right? Don't bear false witness. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't murder. And then here we get to the Beatitudes, and it's more of this, hey, do this, do that. Um, it's more of this state of being, though. Not just rules. It's like, hey, this is how, uh, yes, this is how to act, how to live. But it's not just do this, do that. It's this inside out. Hey, I want you to actually be a different person. I want you to be a new creation. Not in of yourself, but in Christ. This inward transformation. Because for Jesus, there isn't, this, there isn't this big divide between what you believe in Christ and how you live your life in Christ. It's not this big divide between faith and action. And so he's telling us, hey, not what ne- necessarily what a follower of Jesus does, but what a follower of Jesus is. And then um, to help us set up, you know, there's, we see it, right? It's the first word there. Blessed. Blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed is this person. And so what does that word mean as we dive into the Beatitudes? Uh, a lot of people, you know, when we think of blessed, we think of blessing, something that we have been given, something that has now made our life circumstances good. You know, we'll even kind of have that out there, social media, hashtag blessed, right? And that means something good happened. And Jesus is not saying, hey, here's how to have just a good life. Here's how to have blessings, and, and, it, and it's kind of, you know, so that's not what he's talking about. And we, so, some translators have it as, as kind of happy. Um, and and it, there's some truth to that. But again, for us, we think of happy as my life circumstances are good. Uh, you know, for the Bible, the happy would be more so of like, hey, you have this deeper inner joy, this deeper inner peace, not so much in your circumstances, but in your relationship with Jesus in Christ. But here's what the word really means. It means approved or favored. And so when he, when he says, hey, the, um, in, in uh, Isaiah 65, God says, hey, wh- where am I going to find a place to dwell? My, is it going to be in temples? Is it going to be in houses? Have not, have not my hands made all these things? But he says, but to this one will I look. He's saying, hey, this is the one that has favored me. This is the one that has pr- approval of me. The one who's humble, broken, trembles at my word. And so that, that, that's kind of what it's saying here is this this hey, blessed is this, God, this kind of favor with God. Not necessarily, hey, because you're good enough, but it's just, even we'll say, hey, bl- we'll, uh, in scriptures, bless the Lord. Right? And it's saying, hey, man, we are so approve of who God is. Not that he needs our approval, but that's just what it means. So it's this blessing, this favor. And the first four attitudes, again, the attitudes, they deal with our vertical relationship, primarily with God. The next four deal primarily with our horizontal relationship with others. Again, that's very similar to the Ten Commandments. The first four Ten Commandments, uh, you know, thou shalt not have no gods before me. Um, All of those are more of our vertical relationship. The last six are horizontal. So it just kind of um, does that. And and also we're going to notice how they build off of one each other. It's not just kind of in isolation. Here's this one, here's this one, and this one. But they build off of each other. So here here we go. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit... For the kingdom of God is theirs. 
Man, we love that one, right? I mean, and so when it says poor in spirit, it's not saying poor in money, but poor in spirit. Spiritual, spirituality, or you're in poverty spiritually. Spiritually, you're bankrupt. I like how um, Bible teacher Jen Wilkin contrasts the, the Beatitudes with the world. She says, poor in spirit goes against self-sufficiency. Right? You recognize, man, my soul is in need. And Jesus puts this one, I think, first because this is what all of the rest build off of. If you kind of don't have this, if this is not true of yourself, then the rest of this is not really going to follow. Now, I think most of us, we have some kind of need when it comes spiritually. I think a lot of people, most probably everybody in this room, most people in this world would say, Leah, hey, I'm not perfect. I've done some bad things, but I've done some good. That's how we'd kind of phrase it, right? I have made some mistakes, but I'm not that bad. In Luke 18, Jesus talks about this story about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Pharisee would be the religious elite. Man, they're, they're, they're like mega pastors, and they're doing all the amazing things. They're following the law really strict. Tax collector would have been despised by everybody, thought that he would have betrayed all of his fellow countrymen. And so he's like, hey, a Pharisee and a tax collector... A really good guy and a really bad guy go to the temple and they go to pray. And this is what it says. It says that the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Not greedy, unrighteous, adulterers. Hey, thank you, God, that I'm not even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give, give a tenth of everything that I get. Right, we, we, we probably not like to admit it, but we approach God very similarly to that. Hey, God, I've done some bad, but I've also done some good. Here's a quick way. When do you feel most inclined to go to God or free to go to God? Is it after you had a good day or after a bad day? Right? I've had my quiet time. God, now I can, now I can ask you for forgiveness for something. Right? Because we think, here, kind of put it this way, we think we got some money in the bank. God, I don't have much money. I can't go buy that car. But I do have some. What would you take for a down payment? Right? That's kind of how it is. But, but Jesus is saying like, no, you need poor in spirits recognizing you got nothing in the bank. Your, your, your soul is in utter, complete need. You got nothing. There, there's nothing that you're going to God with that has this merit of just like, hey God, I think you're pretty impressed. Hey God, I got kind of my life together. You know, we're, we're in complete spiritual poverty. I mean, I, again, I think most of us kids, you could relate to this. Even adults, when you were a kid, you could relate to this. Hey, can I get on the TV? Can I get on a screen? I cleaned my room. Right? You're saying, hey, I need something, and you got it. You have the power, adult. Yes, I do. You better recognize that. Please recognize that. Right? And, and it's like, hey, but I've done some of my chores. Right? I've done something, so now let me get it. Because I need it. You have it. And that's how we are with God. Right? I, you have something I need, but I've also I've kind of done something, Right? I've, I've, I'm not like that person. I'm not like that tax collector. And notice what, just going back to, to Luke 18. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but he kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And God, I have nothing. God, I'm in utter, complete need of you. I have nothing to merit acceptance to God. I bring nothing to the table. God, I'm totally empty. I mean, right after the Sermon on the Mount, and then um, right after this in Matthew 18, there's a leper. And the lepers, you know, they're shunned from the community of God. They have all their disease, uh, you know, on their skin. Nobody could touch him. And what does this leper do? He comes to Jesus and he's like, Please, God, if you will, Jesus, heal me. Complete need. 
God, if something is going to happen, it's totally because of you. Because who am I? I'm diseased and I'm sick. And God is saying, hey, that's the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And there's this promise, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Hey, if you really want to have and experience the kingdom of God, you can't come to to God on your own thinking that you're going to somehow get this on your own. Hey, if you don't recognize your need, if you think you're pretty hot stuff, if you think you're doing okay, man, you're going to miss it. Because the fact of the matter is, man, you, you don't have anything. You can't really have the kingdom of God if you think you can earn it. But over and over again in Scripture, it's like, hey, here's the good news. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. It is by grace. Grace alone through Christ alone. Poor and blessed are the poor in spirit because when you see your poverty, theirs is the kingdom of God. It's a gift. And then it builds off of this. And he says in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And it's kind of building off of blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's like, hey, blessed are those who mourn their sin. We're grieved by it. Man, if I see my spiritual poverty, then I see, gosh, I'm not as good as I really think I am. Man, when I see what actually the darkness and the sin that lies behind there, even if nobody else around me knows it, man, there's pride. There's greed. There's this desire for other people's approval. Again, I'm not talking of me myself. I'm talking of some hypothetical person. <laughs> right? We, we, we mourn our sin. This uh, again, Jen Wilkins says, this stands against somebody who is self-satisfied. All right? Hey, sin, that's somebody else's problem. We're good at condemning the sin in others. Right? I ask one of my kids, hey, so, you know, you, you see the mess, something's happened. You, you hear it from a different room and you come in there. Somebody's crying. You just tell them to walk it off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I'll ask them, you know, I'll ask them, be like, hey, you, what did you do? And pretty much always, they'll say, well, they, right? That's how I did it. Well, we're, we're having a failure to communicate. I didn't ask you what they did. I asked you what you did. Well, they, and what they're saying is, is like, I'm fine. Hey, are you mourning your sin, child? No, you're not. Right? You're mourning their sin. They stink. And that, that's how we react a lot of times. It's, it's much easier to see the sin in others than to see it in ourselves. But he says, blessed, it, blessed. it's good for you to mourn your sin. It's actually good for you to be in touch with that, to be like, man, there is stuff there that's not of Christ. That's not in the life of Christ. Not that we live in shame and condemnation, but we're just actually saddened by our sin. Again, that might just be how we question who God is, our failure to believe who He is. Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. Even the prodigal son in Luke 15, think he kind of, we see both the poor in spirit and the mor- and mourning sin. You know, he says, Father, I have sinned against you and I'm not worthy, worthy to be called your son. So he knows that as he approaches his father, how's he approaching his father? Totally in poverty. And the only thing that I could rely on is the goodness and grace of my father to accept me and bring me back. That's it. And Jesus said, man, blessed is that. Blessed is that if that's going on inside of you, that you're poor in spirit, that you mourn your sin. I think even mourning can include the brokenness of of not just yourself, but of the world. The sin and death, the destruction that's all around us. But he says, man, hey, whether you're in your sin or just kind of the, the fallenness of the world, you shall be comforted. That's the promise. Why are you going to be comforted? Because the gospel saves you. Jesus saves you. You're not going to be comforted because you, you like pulled yourself up by your brute stops and made yourself better. But hey, as you repented, as you turned away from your sin and you turned to God, He's the one that saves you. He's the one that heals you. He's the one that changes you. So we're comforted through Him. And we're comforted. I mean, it says you shall be. It's future. 
You shall be comforted. Why? Because one day there will be no more sin. One day there will be no more sickness. One day we will not live in a broken and fallen world, whether that's internally or externally, all around us. You shall be comforted. Not because of you, but the promises of Jesus. He will make all things new. And then we see, if you mourn over your sin, that leads us to the third one. Um, Verse um, verse 5, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth, or you might have it as meek. Blessed are the meek. That meekness or humility is setting aside your agenda for God's. Hey, it's not about my, my desires, my own interests, but it's God's. You see that you're dependent on God. You're humble before God. This stands against the self-assured or the self-determined. Right? The, the world says... You do you. You know what's best for you. You determine who you are. You determine what is just best in your life. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble. The ones who are saying, hey, it's not about me. It's not about just my opinions, what I think is best. But hey, I'm actually going to look to God. Jesus said, hey, I've come not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me, my Father. Philippians 2 I think really shows us this very well in Christ. And it says this, it says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And Jesus said, hey, it's not my will. It's not about my desires, but desires of the Father. And for most of us, we're kind of meek. We're kind of humble. We're kind of dependent on God. Right? We, we kind of think, hey, God, I kind of know what's going on over here in this part of my life. But hey, this part of my life is pretty messy and hard. So God, I'll ask you, do something there. Not over here. I got that together. Or I just don't want you to speak into it. It just doesn't matter. I'll determine what's best. But hey, God, you got a little something? Help me. Give me a job. Hey, hey, God, help me with this. Help me with my kids. I don't know what to do there. Help me with this relationship. But Jesus is saying, hey, but kingdom people, as you, as you, mourn, as you are poor in spirit, as you mourn your sin... Man, you see that you, got, you need God not just in parts of your life, but you need God in every part of your life. Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Look to Him. Acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. God, I submit to you, not my ways, but yours. Your wisdom, your power. And then as, as we're meek, as we're humble and we're looking to God, God, you, you speak, you direct, then he's gonna, that's going to lead us to changing what we want, our desire, our appetites. In verse 6, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is a desire to be, that righteousness, it, it could be kind of two ways. One way is just being right with God. This, I think Paul, Paul shows us in Philippians 3. It says, um, And I want God more than anything so that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law. I want this righteousness, but it's not from me, from doing the right stuff, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. Hey, that, I, I want the righteousness of Christ, and that's going to happen through trusting in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made Jesus the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness of God in Him. So we have this right standing with God that comes not from us but through Him. And that hunger and thirst for righteousness yes it it includes that, that kind of just right standing with God but it also just is this hunger and this thirst for, hey, I want to live in conformity to the way of God. I want to live in conformity to God's will. Because if I'm meek and I'm seeking God's direction, and then as He reveals Himself, as He reveals what it looks like to live as a follower of Christ, then I want it. I want those things. I want to follow Christ in my life. 
I want to, to be that kind of person. Not conform to the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Is there this hunger in you? Is there this thirst in you for God to shape you into more of who Jesus is? If not, don't hear me saying, well, just go, go get hungry for it. If you're just like, you know what, there really is a lack of a desire to, to follow God and to be like Jesus, then I would say, hey, then realize your spiritual poverty. Poor in spirit. Mourning your sin. Being humble before God and realizing, man, I don't know anything. I really don't know what's best for me. And so we, we're looking to Him. And sin, sin in your life, you know, prevents you from that, that intimacy with God. And I would just say this with, with sin, and it's something that I think that we really forget today in our world. With sin, there's always a victim. And I would say, at least it's you. And so as sin is going on in your life, that is hindering you from life and intimacy with Jesus. At a minimum. Is there this this desire in you like, man, I don't want that. I don't want this pride. I don't want this greed because, man, then I'm missing out on just being in the life of Christ, living out who he's made me. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Have you ever swam underwater, just held your breath really long, and you're like, all right, hey, I'm going to swim from here to there underwater the whole way, and you're getting kind of there, um, and you're getting closer, and you're like, oh, man, it's like 10 more yards, but oh, good gosh, you know, and, and you're, you're, you just start like, and then when you come up to get water, you're just like, you're not like, huh. that's nice, right? You, you're just like, huh. or you know, you're watching the movie, and the person's underwater, you're just like, Get up, get up, you know. There's this like, I need it. Not, not because, oh, hey, it's just kind of something that I could kind of use. It's like, man, I need that air. Because if I don't, I'm cut off from what's going to give me life. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Because it's like, man, if I don't, if, I, if that is not being conf- like happening in my soul, I'm being like distanced from the source of life in Christ, in this intimacy with him. To hunger and thirst, man, I want God, want Him, more of Him in my life. Paul says in Philippians 3, man, I consider everything garbage. I consider everything just trashed compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. When you see Jesus for the treasure that He is, man, you're just like, man, I want more of Him. And Jesus says, you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. Jesus says, man, come to me. Come to me who are all burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. You shall be filled. Why? Because anything else that you hunger and thirst for out in this world, it's not going to fill you. And I think most of us, we keep trying, and then it keeps not working. You got that boyfriend, girlfriend, and you get them, and guess what? That's it. However awesome they are, they're not meant to bear the weight of your soul. However awesome that new job is, eventually you find out, man, serving these people is kind of lame sometimes. (laughs) Hey, my boss doesn't always know what he's doing. Or she. Right? That happens. Why? Because that's, sure, you want a great job, but it's not meant to bear the weight of your soul. But he's like, hey, hunger and thirst for me. Hunger and thirst for for, for my life. In my spirit living in you, you shall be filled. Because I'm the only one that can actually fill that. And so it, then uh, the next, so those are the kind of more of our vertical relationships with God. And then in verse 7, it turns to be more horizontal. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. This doesn't mean that God only gives mercy to those who show mercy. But showing mercy to others shows that you have really received mercy. And understand that you've received mercy. It demonstrates how aware you are that you have received mercy from God. And Jen, again, Jen Wilkin points out that this stands in opposition to the self-justified. Those who think that they have a right to be angry. And maybe you do. Those who think that they have a right to get back at others. And again, maybe you do. 
but they're just like, they were wrong, and I'm going to make sure that they pay for it. The world tells you that, right? You have a right to be mad. Jesus says, you've been shown an incredible amount of mercy, more than you could ever know, so extend that to others. Matthew 18, there's a, there's a man, he has a huge debt. And basically it adds up to 60 years of working wages. I mean that, well I guess if you're like, well I only work at Amigos, maybe that's not much, I don't know. But, but I mean even that, that's a lot of money. Man, 60 years of working, this is what this guy owes this other guy. And this guy says, hey, man it's been a while, it's time to pay up. And the guy that's in debt, he just throws himself at the feet and he says, please forgive me. Man, I don't, I don't have it. And the person that um, he's indebted to says, hey, yeah, we'll forgive you. I'll forgive you of that. Then later on, the guy who was forgiven of the 60 years of wages goes, and there's somebody else that owes him a day wage, five, 20 bucks, whatever. And he's, met, he's like, hey, you owe me, pay up. The guy says, I don't have it, please have mercy on me. He goes, nope, go to jail. That just shows you that the guy, the, the guy that owed the six years of wages didn't really understand how much he was forgiven. Because then, man, if you just for, were, were forgiven millions of dollars, what's 20 bucks? Right? You'd, man, of course I would st- extend that to somebody else. Or even the good Samaritan. Samaritans were despised, rejected by the Jews. And there's this bloody, beaten up Jew on the side of the road. The good Samaritan takes care of him, puts him on the horse. And then Jesus says, at the end of it, who was the one that showed mercy? That's the question. Man. Or who was the neighbor? The one that showed mercy. And even though he would have been mistreated, even though he would have been ridiculed, The Samaritan still showed mercy. The more that you see the mercy that God has just lavishly poured out onto you, the more that you will extend that to others. I mean, and just think, is God reluctant with his forgiveness to you? Is he reluctant? Is he he purposely holding back or is he like freely giving that? So blessed are the the, the merciful for they will be shown, they will show mercy to others. They've received that. Next one is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Your desires, you know, blessed and pure in heart, your desires have been purified. David prays to God. God, create in me a clean heart. Jesus warned the Pharisees that they might pray. They're, they're praying so that they might be seen by others. So that they would look good. But Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And what he's saying here is, hey, no hidden agenda. Right? You just want to love God and you want to love others. No hidden agenda, no secret motives, and not that you're just doing this in for yourself, but there's this honesty, there's this sincerity, no false motives, no deception. You're transparent before God and before everybody else with pure motives. No hypocrisy. And I thought, man, that sounds like Facebook and social media. <laughs> right? Like we're all like, that's, this is exactly my life. It sounds how we all portray ourselves. But we like to wear a mask. We like to put up a front. We we can think that it's really easy just for those maybe in leadership positions or governing officials, hey, it's easy for them to have a hidden agenda. But none of us do, right? Ever. I mean, I've heard people years ago say that they just go to a certain church so they can network hidden agenda right are you, are you there just because that's a good church and you just want to worship God and love others now that'll be good for my business blessing <laughs> right even, even in, your, in your life are you just motivated by love not so that you could get a promotion at work but because you're just like man this is what a follower of Jesus would look like and I just want to do the right thing in Christ. In your relationship with somebody else, are you just like, man, hey, I just want them to think I'm awesome. I mean, hey, I want to be honest with you. Sometimes, like, I wrestle with that. Hey, you get somebody visiting here, and you're like, man, are they going to come back? Or are they just going to think, that was a long sermon. So, guys, that was boring. It's hot in here. Right? I wrestle with those, but is there this purity of heart? I like how um, that's motivated by love. I like how 
Um, Pastor J.D. Greer, what he said about this. He said, purity leads to clarity. The more your heart is free from idolatry, things that you treat as way more important than what they really are, uh, that you put before God. So the more your heart is free from idolatry and lust, the more you'll see what God sees. Value what God values and love what God loves. The purer your heart, the greater your grasp on the will of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, because they're not looking to other things. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is in contrast to divisiveness. How much time and energy do you spend trying to prove your point? On something that maybe doesn't matter. What happens in a relationship if somebody doesn't agree with you? Or see things the way that you see them? Stands in opposition to those who are self-promoting. Being a peacemaker requires a lot of humility. It isn't about me. It's not about me being right about this or that. But a peacemaker will say, hey, I value you, you, the relationship with you, more than I value being right. Or the more that I value you thinking my opinion's right. I value you. And praise God, that's how God treats us. Right? Because it's obvious that we are wrong. We don't always think like God. But God's like, man, I didn't wait for you to get your, all your act together. Before I can make peace with you. No, I sent my son and he died for all of your sins, all of your dumbness, so that I can make peace with you. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. Because, hey guys, as we just put down our our kind of, our, our, I don't know, like, right to be, or our, our kind of need to be right... Or that we think that somebody might be trampling even on our rights. When we put those down and say, hey, I value you more than that. Not that we just let everything slide. I'm not saying that. But we, as we are peacemakers, then people will see God around us. Because we exhibit God to the world around us. They shall be called sons of God. Man, that's like Christ. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Just like it said in verse 3, and I think verse 11 and 12 kind of expand on, on, on that last one there for verse 10, because the, the pronoun there changes to you. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Not because of you, not because of your opinion, not because of any of those things, but because of me, because of Jesus. Be glad and rejoice because... Your reward is great in heaven. So if you're, hey, I like what Jesus is doing here because he's given us a like real honest heads up about what's to happen. You, we, we do this, I, at least I try to do this with my kids. Like, hey, we're about to go to the store. Hey, and I just want to let you know, you ain't getting anything. <laughs> we're getting milk and stuff for cookies. And that's it. <laughs> right? That's it. We always get what you want. I'm making you the cookies. Right? And it's like, hey, we're not buying anything. No Lego set, no treat. Getting in a store? We're getting out of the store. That's it. Right? And I'm just telling them, hey, this is, this is what's to happen. I don't want you to be shocked by this. And Jesus is saying, hey, if you, want, if you want to live like a new person in the kingdom of God, hey, there'll be some that are really attracted to that. But not everybody. And you're going to be persecuted because of my sake. But you know what's going to happen. But then he says, hey, but if you're persecuted, here's your response. Here's, here's what you should do. Be glad. Rejoice. Why? Because God's going to make things awesome for you now? Nope. Hey, be glad because great is your reward going to be tomorrow. Nope. Says it right there. Verse 12, be glad because your reward is great in heaven. Hey, things might really stink for you here. You might be really taken advantage of. You might be like, look like this. You might be persecuted. Your, some of your family might be sneaking around to just even worship with, with God or whatever it might be. But hey, that's not eternity. Your reward will be great in heaven, in eternity. And so those are the Beatitudes, not this list of rules and uh, just, hey, do things, but the state of being, the state of like life in Christ, what, what new life in Jesus produces in us and through us. And just kind of, you know, think through this just real quick. There are three things that I think that we need to really think about from this. 
that we need to really latch on to that help us grab on to the Beatitudes. First is this, desire. There's just three things, three Ds, yay. First is desire. Where I think most of us, when we approach this, there is this desire. Man, I want my life to be like that. I want to, to not just live like that outwardly. I want to be that kind of person. I definitely want somebody else to be that kind of person. And I definitely want all the second half. I want to be comforted. I want to be rewarded in heaven. Poor in spirit some days. Right? But, but if Jesus is saying, hey, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is what the people of God, who they are, what a Christian is, what a follower of Jesus is, there should be this desire for us. So like, man, I, I want to live my life that way. I want to be that kind of person. But I would say if it stops there, this is going to fall flat. Because even a lot of people that don't believe in Jesus think this is right. And here's the other part, and this is why I like the Sermon on the Mount, because it's like, man, this is kingdom living. But here's the, the second part is defeat. If you just have desire, you're never going to actually, nothing's really going to happen. Defeat is the second one. This is why I don't like the Beatitudes. Because I read this and I'm like, ooh, yeah, hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm not like that. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm like that. Say, what? That's all, like, that doesn't look like me at all. Maybe not even on my good days. When I, when I read these things, I, I feel a little, I feel convicted. I feel a little condemned. Man, I'm not always merciful. This doesn't always look like me. This makes me kind of squirm in my seat when I read these things. But feeling defeated is actually a good thing if you read these. And I would say if you read these and you feel a little bit of that, I would say that that's a good thing. Because where does it all start? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that, that, that recognize that they don't just need Jesus for salvation, but God, actually, I need you in everything. And that leads us to the last thing is dependence. Man, you might have a desire for it. You might feel defeat for it, but it moves us to dependence. God, I need you in this. I can't do this. I can't just become and will myself to be this kind of person. I don't have what it takes And for any of us, for this to, to, to be more and more of who we are and who we're becoming, we actually don't need to be looking at ourselves, but look to the one that actually fulfilled these perfectly. Second Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you know the grace of, the Lord our, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. Man, who is poor in spirit? Man, it wasn't me. Christ became poor so that I and you might become rich in him. Jesus mourned your sin more than you do, more than you ever could. He mourned it so much, he couldn't ignore it, he couldn't lessen it. And that's why he paid the price for it on the cross. Jesus was meek, he had all the power that he, he, any human person could ever have, but he emptied himself and he made himself nothing. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness that he became sin so that you might have righteousness. Jesus was offended. He was scorned. He was mocked. He was betrayed. But then yet on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He was rich in mercy so we might be made alive for him. Jesus was pure in heart. He had no hidden agenda. No weird motives, but he just said, man, I came to seek and to save the lost. I have come that you may have life. Jesus made peace between us and God. He didn't think about his rights, but he laid them down. And just recognize before any of these beatitudes describe you, they describe him. And we can have the kingdom of God. We can be comforted. We can inherit the earth. We can see God because Jesus did this for us. We have mercy because Jesus got none. He's the hero of the Beatitudes. And so we're utterly and completely dependent on Him. And, you know, if, if, if you've never really trusted in Christ, I would absolutely hate it for you to leave here and think you better clean your act up. I would absolutely hate it here if you think leave, and, like, leave here and just be like, hey, I'm going to go try to be a better person. I'd just say, man, give that up. 
That is, there's, no, there's not going to be any life in that. Man, turn to Christ, the one who has done all of this for you, the one that paid the price for your sin. Not so that you could be a better person, but that you could be a new person, forgiven and have a relationship with him. And when we, you know, if you are following Christ, I'd say that, man, when we, de- when we look to Christ, when we depend on him, when we see the gospel, we're our poor in spirit, man, that changes everything. How we see God in ourselves because of what Jesus has done, that's how we're actually truly blessed. Not because the circumstances of our life are great. We have this favor, this relationship, this intimacy with God, and we're experiencing life and joy in Him because He is the hero of the Beatitudes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we thank You that You are... Yeah, that, that before we even look to ourselves in any of this, Lord, we look to you. We, de- we have this utter dependence on you, the one that has done all these things, has fulfilled all these things, Lord, that you were made poor so that we might be rich, Lord. We praise you for that. And God, I pray that, that you, yes, that you would give us this desire in this, for this. Um, Lord, but that we would... We would recognize our defeat in this and so that we're dependent on you, God. And so help us to be humble, but not in despair because you, God, are with us and are perfect where we completely aren't, God. And so we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.